Right, so good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to our next event in the Source series. Um, very pleased to have a Digital Humanities event this week. So it's a slightly different area, I think, to, to the previous talks that we've had. Um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction. I'm Jeremy Cohen from Imperial College. I'm going to be chairing the um, the event today. Um, I'll just give a, a brief introduction to um, Source and uh, today's event, and then I will will hand over to our speakers. So we're going to have two presentations uh, this afternoon. We've got approximately 20 to 25 minutes for each talk, and we're going to have the two talks together, and then we'll have time for Q&A after the two talks. Um, but you're welcome to post into the chat any questions that you have as we go along, and we'll endeavour to go back through the chat and, and make sure that those get answered. So uh, do, put, do put questions in as we go along if you've got things that you would like to have answered. Um, after the after the talks and the Q and A, we'll have a discussion time for a discussion and networking session. So, as I mentioned, for those of you that were that were on just when I we were when people were joining, uh, this is being recorded, and uh, we will stop the recording at the end of the the Q and A for the talks, um, so that we've got some uh, time to go into breakout rooms and have uh, time for networking. Um, I'd just like to also highlight to you the source code of conduct that you can see at the bottom of the page there. So uh, we, we do ask that, that people familiarize themselves with that and to ensure that in any interactions that you have as part of source that you adhere to the, the code of conduct. Um, I'm going to now just say a little bit about our upcoming events. So for those of you that have been to previous uh, sessions uh, that we've had over the last few weeks, you'll know that we've, we've got a, um, a calendar with uh, quite a number of events coming up over the next the next few weeks. This is uh, what's happening up until the start of November. Uh, so there's lots to to keep keep you busy there if you're interested to come to some of our future events. So do do look those up on the source website. You can see the program link at the top of the page. And there's also a link there to submit if you'd like to submit a, um, a proposal for a, a talk, a workshop, post session, or anything uh, anything along the lines of, of that, we've got a number of different types of events that you can that you can submit. And I also highlight that we do actually have a deadline. It's it's tomorrow, so it's a little bit short if you're not already preparing something. Uh, but we do have uh, running monthly rolling monthly deadlines. So if you can't make it in time for tomorrow to submit something, there's an opportunity to submit for the next month's deadline. But do bear that in mind if you would like to. Uh, propose an event under the source series. So with that, um, I'm, we're going to move on to the talks and I'm really pleased to uh, welcome James Smithies and Ariana Kuehler, who are um, uh, from King's Digital Laboratory based at King's College London. Um, I think King's Digital Lab, if, it, if you're not aware of King's Digital Lab, they are a digital humanities RSE group who have done like a huge amount of work to, to, to bring RSE and digital humanities together. Um, there's also been a lot of work in terms of the, the model they have for structuring their, their careers for RSEs. Um, and I think it's a really interesting setup. So it'd be really nice to hear um, from, from them about the lab and some of the work that they've been doing. Um, so I'm going to, going to hand over, I think James is going to um, present first. So um, I will hand over James to you and I will cancel my screen share and you can, uh, you can share your screen. So thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. I'll share my screen. Do you see my screen now? It's just starting now. Uh, I'll have to go over to the screen, I guess. Ah, there we go. Yep, that's good. All right. Okay. Um, so we're just going to use the same slide deck. Um, I'll start off. Um, and, and Ariane will, will follow on from me. Um, so I'm director of King's Digital Lab. I'm also deputy director of e-research at King's. So the talk today is about King's Digital Lab, but it's in the context of a wider institutional strategy. Um, oh. There we go. Um, so we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about King's Digital Lab is an experiment. Um, it's too easy to sort of fall into a habit of viewing research software engineering as purely a service. And, and we're really um, quite forcefully focused on research on the research aspect of research software engineering. Um, had a meeting with the team today and I, I want, want to sort of provoke them into thinking about research services and what research services might look like to put those two things together. Um, 
but our focus on setting up the lab has been very much for sort of viewing it as an experiment, as a lab experiment in itself. Um, and that allows us to reflect on it and um, experiment, not just in terms of um, the research that we do, but also the operational models and the HR models that we, that we deploy. Um, and it, you know, in, in some senses, it helps the conversation with um, our administrators and managers as well, because we frame everything as an experiment. It allows us to do sometimes quite risky things and then pull it back if it doesn't work. Um, so the model that we're going to share today is, is, is an experiment in itself, but it's, it's just one amongst um, you know, several. So sort of the tagline for this slide is enabling digital humanities at scale. Um, and, and anyone involved in e-research or e-science you know, probably won't see this as particularly large scale. Um, but for digital humanities, um, we are quite a large scale lab. We've been operational since 2015. Um, we actually inherited uh, infrastructure and some people um, from a department of digital humanities at King's College that's been, um, digital humanities has been going at King's for 40, 50 years now, um, which is part of the reason that KDL is quite developed. We didn't, we didn't evolve out of nothing. We inherited a, a huge amount of resources and expertise. Um, so we've been operational since 2015. Um, between 14 and 19 staff, we've got 14 permanent staff. Um, it was one of the enlightened things that um, our faculty did when they set up KDL was they shifted everybody from contract, um, fixed term contracts onto permanent contracts. And I think if, if we're going to say there's one thing um, that has led to our success, it's really that, it's just permanent contracts. Um, there's something slightly unusual about KDL is that we have a division of labour across our software engineering cycle. Um, so most RSEs that I've come across uh, tend to be sort of generic scientific programmers. Um, we, we have a, a software engineering life cycle that Ariana will describe in more detail um, that has a variety of different roles. So we have research software analysts, we have research software um, engineers, designers, assistance manager and project manager. Um, and we also have research affiliates and, and visiting fellows to to give us that research, you know, add to our, the, the research side of the lab. Um, quite a significant technical infrastructure for a digital humanities lab. We manage about 200 virtual machines, um, close to a, a terabyte of RAM. Um, we, we haven't been using cloud very much, but, but we're starting to um, explore a migration to cloud um, over the next year or two. We, we inherited 100 projects um, and we've, we've been involved in about 160. Um, those 100 projects are difficult to manage because they're um, heterogeneous in their technology. So old Java apps, uh, a lot of PHP originally, um, but we're effectively a Python Django shop. So we've spent the last three years ring fencing that legacy estate, as we call it, um, we have lots of issues with it, lack of documentation, um, lack of funding, um, but equally we didn't want to just unplug them either. So we've, we've spent three years sort of rationalising and assessing the value of those projects, putting them all under um, service level agreements um, and getting funding in place for them, short term funding. So now we support about 60, um, about 50 million web hits a year. Um, and we manage about 5 million digital objects, we think, although it's a little bit tricky to count sometimes, uh, mainly um, images of manuscripts and, and documents. The, the basic business, business model of, the, of the, the lab is that we're underwritten internally. So our Faculty of Arts and Humanities pays our bills, basically, and then we have cost recovery um, KPIs that we, we um, support through external funding. So just working with partners to bring in external funding. We've been involved in uh, about 55 million pounds worth of grant bids since we started, um, over 2 million pounds worth of successful ones. And um, last year we had a 60% success rate. So we're doing something right in terms of the projects that we engage in. And, and more importantly, the work that Ariana and co do in 
designing the technical solutions that support the grant bids. Um, we assessed, I think, 160 projects this year, um, the year before 400. Um, and that tends to lead to about 30 grant proposals each year. So this is where we sit within the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Uh, we underpin digital capability across our faculty. Uh, we have a special relationship with digital humanities um, because we evolved out of digital humanities. So in essence, the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at King's has a research software engineering lab um, with 15 to 20 people and uh, an academic department who also do digital humanities technical research as well. Um, and about 600 students, 40 staff, I think at the moment. So this is um, digital humanities at scale um, with both a software engineering and teaching component. But we work across all of the departments. We do a lot of work with history and English, um, culture, media, creative industries, you, you name it. And what we do, um, we develop collaborative research proposals and projects. Um, so our bread and butter is to work with colleagues who want to put in a grant proposal with a digital output. And that digital output could be anything. It could just be an algorithm, or it could be a, a digital um, repository of, of manuscripts, um, mobile apps. Um, we're starting to move more into extended reality, so virtual reality, augmented reality, for various, various um, purposes. That's basically what we do. We work, we, we, we work with colleagues to define a technical solution. We help them with their grant bid. When they get their funding, um, they come back to us and we build it and maintain it. We also provide consultancy, um, less so because of demand. We have um, a three month waiting list at the moment to meet with us. Um, but we do try and do consultancy for digital methods and technologies. Um, that tends to be more um, external partners um, so we work with internal and external partners. Um, we've had a real focus on sustainability, so enhancing and repurposing existing digital resources as part of our legacy mandate, our mandate to maintain our legacy estate. Um, and we've, we've actually published some articles um, related to that. One thing we haven't really succeeded in in our five years is provision and maintenance of a common infrastructure and shared tools for resources across the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Um, we have enough trouble sort of keeping up with our own infrastructure requirements, let alone providing them to colleagues. But ideally, that's what we would do. Um, we would have a production and development estate or infrastructure and, and also provide on-demand resources for staff and students. So that's a, on the wish list still. We run events, uh, internships, workshops, training, and occasional teaching. Um, and by occasional, I mean that the odd, the odd guest lecture here and there. And the team get half a day a week to work on um, their own personal projects. So in terms of um, career paths, we've done a lot of thinking about research software engineering careers and where but where they, where they fit on, a, I guess, a, a, the academic to service continuum. Uh, part of this has been um, driven by, by my belief that um, the team's never going to be effective and we're gonna, not going to produce high quality research outputs if um, we don't have pride in our professional identity. And there's been a real lack of um, professional identity or career roles for um, for what we're now calling research software engineers, of course. Um, so we, um, I know in the sciences, RECs often sit very close to the academic end of the continuum, whether it's as a, a fellow or a, a postdoc. In KDL, we sit right up to the border of the academic career, um, but on, on the IT side of it, I suppose you could say. Um, so KDL, um, we are research intensive. Um, anybody in the team could be PI or co -I. Um Generally, um, that doesn't happen. Uh, I'll talk about the, the options for that more later. Um, well, 
Yeah, so team roles, we have uh, research, research software analysis, design, engineering, systems management, and project management. Um, and they've all got their own role description and um, they're aligned to the skills framework for the information age or SOFIA. Um, the idea was that, you know, if we want career paths, we have to have a formal document and you can have a look at it online um, that defines things for our faculty, but also benchmarks us against industry. So there's a lot of uncertainty about just where RSEs fit next to academ um, academics um, and IT. So we've benchmarked ourselves to academia as well as industry. Um, <clears throat> and we um, also align to Agile DS DSDM. So we're effectively an Agile self software engineering shop and, um, and Ariana can talk more about that soon. But it's this blend, what we've tried to do with our careers is blend um, genuine research engagement with um, IT industry methods. And there's been some criticism of the RSE community for software engineering standards and what have you. And it's one, that's one of the things that we're trying to resolve in the lab, but it's not only in terms of research, the quality of our research outputs, it's also in terms of professional identity and um, career progression. So ideally, you know, in my view, a research software engineering engineer within KDL, although we're just saying today, people don't tend to leave KDL, touch wood. Um, but ideally someone in KDL could work with us for a few years and then go to industry um, and come back and not have any um, sort of disruption to their career or their promotion track or their salary. Um, the only way to do that is to have very well defined career paths um, and role descriptions so people can move in and out of industry um, and across to academia as well, of course, and then back. Um, so in that sense, we're positioning research software engineering careers um, at the borderline of universities and industry um, as a sort of a hub, potentially an innovation or creative hub where people can um, sort of move between different sectors. And that I'd include cultural heritage in that for, um, for KDL as well. Um, so this is an example of uh, Ariana's role, a uh, research software analyst. Um, this sort of based on my experience of working in software engineering teams outside universities. So larger teams of up to 50 people where there's a division of labor. Um, I don't think often in academia, I don't think people realize just how unusual the scientific programmer model is that in most software engineering teams, there's, there's a division of labor, more like a production line. So research software analysts uh, are just like a business analyst, really. Um, ideally domain specialists, whether it's history or English, um, but we have generalists as well. Um, and they'll work with the academics to academic colleagues to define their research requirements um, and define the technical solution that will answer their research questions. So the main responsibility is research analysis. Um, so they deploy their existing domain knowledge um, to understand um, algorithms, um, interfaces, um, data models that are required to design and deliver this, the solution um, in question. Um, but there's also a lot of sort of uh, education involved and collab that, that sort of tight intellectual and scholarly collaboration with the academics. Um, our philosophy is that, as you know, every, it is with everyone in RSE, is that the, the goal of our research methods is to integrate um, scholarly and technical methods perfectly. And the research analyst is sort of at the coalface of that conversation. Um, so their goal is to produce a solution overview document, um, elicit requirements, but also think about timelines and cost and the, the scoping and um, management of, of the project. And that all goes into what we call a, a product quote, which Aaron and I will talk about too. Um, but it defines the full technical solution and project management solution, the way that we design and, uh, and deliver. Um, they also take responsibility for the project management of the solution. So they will, um, um, be assigned a lead 
for each project. So they're the lead contact person. A um, little bit of teaching meant to have a personal research agenda, but that research agenda could be in the humanities, um, but it could also be technical. So it could be computer science. Um, community outreach is worth noting as well. Um, KDL, yeah, I think the success of KDL is our attitude towards the community. We view ourselves as a community asset as much as a, a, an asset for, for Kings. Um, and so analysts, everybody is, is expected to, to, or encouraged to engage in community outreach. Um, but we want to be really transparent about what we do, about our values, the way we work, um, and try to enable the broader community. And, and our, goal, our, our basically mantra, I suppose, is that what's good for um, the community is good for us. So we don't, we try not to hold on to things too tightly. And this um, research contribution roles is hot off the press. It was only signed off last week. We got the second management signature that we needed for this. Um, so it's, we have our professional roles. We have our RSE research, research software engineering roles. And they're, they're, they're based around this engagement with academics um, and enabling scholarly outputs and defining technical solutions. Um, but we learn over the years that it becomes um, difficult to define the research role within the project. So we found in some projects, um, they want an RSE as a co-I, for instance, and we might not want to. <laughs> PKI, um, or the opposite is, is more often the case where people put in, RSCs put in a huge amount of intellectual effort, labor into a project, um, and then they might not even get attributed, um, but they're certainly not gonna be asked to be KOI. They're sort of viewed as a service provider. So we've um, put that on its head with a, um, with a research contribution pilot or a framework that is inserted into our software development life cycle in the early design phase. And it requires us to sit down and think really hard about the role that someone in KDL will have on a project. And it's up to the, um, the RSE in question, but the three roles are co-I. So with a substantive intellectual engagement um, and active support from the, the, the PI, um, we will add, one of our RACs will be assigned as co-I if they want to be. There's, there's financial implications of that that I won't go into, um, but it's because of our baseline like professional services contracts. So we, we're not on research contracts, so we don't attract overheads. Um, but, you know, so the, there's a cost, there's a cost to the faculty and we make a business case to be co-I. There was a choice of us going onto research contracts so we'd just be like everybody else, but we actually felt we were better to be on the professional services divide. And then not reasonably rare occasion we want to be co-I, we just put forward a case for it, never been um, declined. Um, sometimes we will just provide research services. Um, and that's what I've just described. Um, our normal role providing technical and method methodological research services um, and there'll be standard technical attribution. A lot of this is about attribution. So if we have a defined, a defined role in a project, there's also defined attribution as well. Um, and then the third option is what we're calling a research, a KDL research package. So sometimes we find ourselves de defining a project um, and there'll be some interesting technical issues that we want to explore, but the PI doesn't want to explore or it doesn't fit, they don't fit within the budget. So in that case, we can um, we have the option of adding an additional KDL research package to the project um, that we will fund out of our baseline lab budget and will be owned by the RSC. So the RSC is effectively PI for the little research package off to the side. Um, and we'll fund that in various ways. We might use a little bit of 10% time. We might get a little bit of money from faculty. We might use a little bit of operating budget. Um, the point in this, though, is all about giving RSEs agency and sort of focusing, not trying to fit RSEs into a particular um, professional academic framework, but assuming that we need to um, define academic careers from a blank canvas. 
um, and provide lots of options for research engagement. Uh, right, so this is my last slide. I don't know if I've gone over or not. I think we're sort of on time, aren't we? Um, Ariana's second half is much more interesting, but this is a nice segue into it. Um, so in terms of, that's how the, the, the team works. Um, we have a series of project meetings within the lab as well. Um, that's driven from a daily stand-up that, that's sort of on Slack now. Um, and then we have a weekly project planning and um, operational management meetings. But the project planning meeting is with the whole team um, is present and we assess the, the new projects that have come in this week and work out whether they align to our research strategy, et cetera, whether we want to move forward with them. Um, and then the, the, the engineering team also have fortnightly time box meetings for capacity management and, and defining the sprints. We have monthly team meetings as well um, and quarterly time box meetings. So in order to um, meet demand, we've recently shifted to six weekly planning. We, we can't handle demand once a week. So we're actually sort of starting to shift things into six weekly cycles that aligns to our quarterly planning. Um, but this is um, a good time to hand over to you, Ariana, actually, because it, we're in an interesting place with the lab where we've done the sort of foundational stuff around careers and we've got a basic operation, operational side set up. And now we're starting to think in a more holistic way um, in quarters and years. And we're finding that it's only at that level when you can start thinking in 12 month chunks, you can actually get purchase over your research strategy and your technical strategy. I mean, this process of, this is a great benefit of having a lab and a sort of a holistic philosophy like this. Is that, is that if you're dealing with things as a lone scientific programmer or on a case-by-case -case basis, um, you don't have the opportunity to engage in that sort of strategic discussion and strategic planning. Um, but the key to that, in, in our mind, is that if we're going to move from this operational research career stuff towards a more holistic philosophy for the lab, it needs to be grounded in engineering methods um, and particularly models. So we want to start thinking more about infrastructure models, architectural models, um, and the way that they relate to our software engineering processes. They have that all grounded and um, you know, right down to our code and data models. Um, and that's what Ariana will talk about next. Thanks, James. Um, so do you want me to take over? Yeah, go for it. Just let me know when you want me to. Sure. Thanks. Um, so hi, everybody. A pleasure to be here. So as, as Jane said, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the juice of what we do. Um, so can you move to the next slide, um, James, please? Thank you. And, and further. Yeah. Um, so we talked about the lab as an experiment in itself. What about the experimentations that we actually do in our daily job? Um, according to Rather, experimentation involves the material realization of an experimental process, and these entails the objects of studies, the apparatus, and their interaction. Um, rather, it is, it, the, the book itself, it's about experimentation across different scholarly and scientific contexts. But so if we can bring it to the case of KDL, our experiment, experimental process is realized through our software development lifecycle. SDLC, and you see here a diagram um, that we use in the lab to illustrate a little bit how it works, even if at a very high level. Um, the apparatus, obviously, are the technical system that we consider adequate for a specific experimental process, and they range from, as uh, James already uh, mentioned, infrastructure and technical stack to architecture and range of models, tools, and apps uh, for development and include indeed also tools for project management and monitoring more in general. Um, I'll go very briefly through this, this, this SDLC um, at a very high level, but if maybe there are questions later, I could go into more details about it. So how do we normally work in practice? Usually a partner contact us. Sometimes it might also be us who activate a project idea or uh, an, an event or conference with me, somebody with whom there is a spark and we want to work together, but typically it's the other way around. So we get contacted by colleagues in faculty or indeed other, other partners in museums, archives, galleries, other institutions and um, research institutions typically in other universities. 
Um, we collect these ideas. As James was saying, we have project planning meetings weekly. We are moving into a most likely a bit of a longer cycle, possibly six week cycle, but we do have that internal assessment at the team level. So everybody has a say on some of those projects, ideas that come our way and they're assessed according to different criteria, from indeed management and organization criteria to financial, to expertise, research interest, workload, uh, and so on. If we think that an idea is indeed something that we'd like to pursue further, then at this point, the analyst, um, an analyst is assigned to that project idea, if you like, and um, takes forward the discussion with the partner a little bit more in detail. And that's where the requirement assessment phase starts. Typically, this is all usually without funding. So it's pre-grant analysis. Sometimes there is already a budget in the pre-grant phase, but that's rare. Um, and then we work together with the partner in that feasibility assessment phase where we elicit requirements, but at the same time also assess the technical feasibility of that project, try to conceptualize and shape it, not only in terms of priorities of requirements, but also, for example, drafting a first solution architecture for that project, maybe forward planning for after the project ends, sustainability and so on. Um, at the end of this process, if feasibility seems feasible, so if it's a go, uh, it's a green light um, project and that requires involvement, not just of the analysts, but the rest of the team, we work very collaborative on that and we have an internal peer review process of these feasibility uh, phases. Uh, we typically produce then a product quote, um, which obviously includes uh, an estimate of the cost of our involvement in a project, but more than that, again, conceptualizes the requirements for the project, prioritize them, even if at a high level, obviously, uh, includes, as I was saying before, some information about risks, um, solution architecture draft, forward planning, uh, delivery, uh, in some cases also a sketch of the increments for the project. And that, that product quote or part of it gets integrated typically in a funding application. So we collaborate with the funding application at different levels as again, James uh, outlined. If the project is successful, there is a kickoff stage, kickoff meeting, where at this point, not only the analyst for the project idea is involved, but also the rest of the sub team within KDL that will work with, with those partners. And at that meeting, very importantly, not only obviously the whole list of requirements is reviewed, the scope of the project is reviewed, but the first increment is defined. So we also kick, kick off the so-called evolutionary development cycle, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which is obviously iterative and incremental, depending how big the project is, how long, how experimental, as opposite to three, five years project, which are some of the projects we're involved in. This, this phase can be more or less long, and uh, typically there will be several deployments, um, again, which might entail different things. Um, and then at the end of the evolutionary development um, cycle, which obviously includes also uh, project review phases of different kind internally and with the partners, there is a release moment or sometimes multiple releases. And this is also when um, our partners sign, we ask our partner to sign a service level agreement if we are going to maintain that resource. Um, and the project then enter a post-project phase. Typically for research council's proposal in the UK, this, we, we normally offer at least five years of um, hosting and maintenance. Um, yes, so what are then the objects of study that we use in this, or we, 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 um, we interact with in this uh, CLC cycle? Well, they're obviously data of different kind, um, and depending on the project, these data already exist at the pre-project phase, and they need sometimes to be massaged or cleaned. In other cases, this data is collected apart, as part of the project activity. But either way, the reason why we're focusing on modeling is because the team makes sense of this project data and import them into KDL system by constructing and interpreting models. That's the main, if you like, um, argument of the, this, this part of the presentation. And, so the products of our experimental process are models, and we intend models here in a very wide sense. So artifacts of different kinds, including but not limited to uh, computational models. Do you want me to, sorry, Anna, do you want me to switch or? Yes, this is fine. I was going to ask you right now. Uh, so the, the production of, of these models happen across the SDLC cycle. So you can see here the same, if you like, the same diagram flattened into the, the different um, phases of the Agile DSDM. Um, approach, which again, probably many of you are familiar with, pre-project feasibility, foundation, evolution, development, deployment, and post-project. 
So the models are produced across these different phases. And next slide, please. And they're also produced, um, we could say across, or they could be grouped into four different operational models. In a, in a recent article um, chapter that James and I um, co-authored for um, a handbook of digital humanities methods, um, we talked about these four different methods, so monitoring methods, maintaining methods, design and building, and arguably you could say that um, models uh, are produced across all these different methods. And we intend design here, I should probably say, in a, again, a wise sense, ranging from techniques of requirement elicitation in pre-project analysis to data modeling and wireframing, framing, for example, in, in an evolutionary development phase. And also we, we intend by design here, uh, it, it's including of analysis, basically. So design and analysis in what normally is considered analysis in design development process studies. And next slide, please. And, and in addition, modeling occurs also across the different RAC roles. In fact, one of the core functions of modeling is to support the translation across cycles of analysis and design. These slides come from the presentation. I should say that actually all the work we're presenting here is not just mine or James, but uh, it relates to the work that all our colleagues do in the lab and it's a team effort. So some of these slides are actually extracted from that presentation of DH 2020, who reflected a little bit on the roles of models um, in the, uh, from an RSC perspective in the digital humanities. So I was saying one of the core functions of modeling is to support the translations across um, different cycles of analysis and design and across roles. So in each cycle, we produce one or more models which can serve to bridge building phases and increments. So for example, an analyst might produce a model of a specific unit of analysis or conceptualization of some of the technical, um, no, sorry, no, no, sorry. It, it might produce a, a model of the, how different units of analysis interact in a project uh, to explain it uh, to the developer or to discuss it with the developer, who in turn might produce specific models to inform, for example, the development or implementation of that model into, say, I don't know, a relational structure. Um, and in its turn, the designer might um, translate further that same, that, that the juice of that model into something that is then used, for example, for the front end of a specific resource. Obviously, this process is not at all linear and is not unidirectional. Um, and in fact, I hope the mess of this slide makes realize that many people are involved and many interactions are part of, of, the, of those um, activities. Next slide, please. Um, and I think you need to press also so that we can see the template. So uh, some of the, uh, yeah, sorry, James, can you also click? Because they should be, yeah, here they are, sorry. Um, some of these modeling activities are documented or partially documented in our SDLC templates. I think there is a link later on in the slides where we point to our um, a wiki where we, we discuss the role of these templates and also provide, um, sorry, back, uh, provide, a, uh, some context for the for the templates themselves and how we use them. But basically this slide is just to say that obviously there'll be some first initial modeling and analysis in even at that first meeting with the partner where we try to define the, the, the research space within which we're working, the research domain, the research questions, the units of analysis and so on. And then those modeling activities become, if you like, more concrete uh, across the life cycle of the project and could, for example, in a, I don't know, project review record document become a data model diagram as opposite to, I don't know, wireframes, as I was saying before, or maybe even uh, extract from uh, software libraries and code that is used um, for uh, processing a certain type of data set. Um, next one, please. Uh, now, in the in the engineering context, model and dri driven engineering, there, there's a lot of literature that looks at models and how to conceptualize them. Uh, we found this article quite interesting by Genova et al, where, where um, they they look at models in a multi-dimensional space and they say that models basically could be defined along these three axes. We could argue whether we could add more axes. So the purpose of, of modeling, are they describing a system as opposite to specify, for example, a new system to build? Are they um, looking at a domain of knowledge in terms of reality or a system uh, and in terms of abstraction, how abstract to concrete are they with respect, for example, to, I don't know, from conceptual modeling to um, physical or implementation 
oriented models. And next one, please. So the two examples I had here, I think you've got a click because there's something missing, um, are in the first case, a very generic diagram that I drew for um, a project where they were looking at um, a tendering process and they wanted to basically use a language in their tendering that was speaking to um, RAC teams, in fact. Um, so this is just an abstract model to describe the system that they wanted to implement and it doesn't really use any specific conventional language. The second example on the other end is a whiteboard uh, drawing, a content map and a static mockup by our um, senior designer, Gina Straferraro, UIX designer, Gina Straferraro. And this is an example of an evolution from abstract to concrete models of the system to define the specifications for that system. So obviously it's a different level. And next slide, please. Um, this is another example from a more recent uh, project, Community of the Realm of Scotland. Um, to give an idea, if you like, of the um, interactions and, and, and process of translations across, the, across different phases of the modeling activities within a project. So in this specific case, I can't really describe too much about the project, but the project is aiming at defining what a dynamic edition is, specifically, I think, mainly of legal documents and how they evolved in time with different manuscript versions and a region of the text that are unsettled, so that had different level of changes um, genesis, if you like. Um, so the panels obviously came up with a definition of dynamic edition, which the analyst um, attempted to uh, define further and understand further, rephrased it, uh, contributed obviously to also develop that definition further as the project um, progressed. Um, and on the side for the project, you'll see there is a um, a diagram, a conceptual diagram that the analyst Paul Caton developed, mainly to indeed clarify some of the conceptual space for that project. Um, and in turn, this, this, this diagram is then accompanied by a glossary, which obviously needs to be read interdependently with that model. Um, and next slide, please. And there, obviously, there, there are not uh, there are interruption and breakthroughs. There, there, as I was saying before, it's not, it's not a linear process, but going, if you like, analyzing further the, the evolution of that modeling activity, the software engineer involved in the project, Geoffroy and all, um, at some point develops a different um, diagram, an entity relation diagram that is, um, is looking at, at those same, oh, th that same conceptual space, but trying to uh, formalize it so that it can be, um, it can inspire the front-end data model, or in fact, um, define that, that front-end data model. So in this case, it was directed at the negotiation and discussions with the designer. And then further down that process, again, not necessarily in a very linear way at all, um, though th that data model is translated into a specific um, language within uh, the Django web framework, which is used extensively uh, within KDL to represent some of the um, relational structure um, of our project and in general as a, as a web framework uh, application. And then further down the line, at some point, the team is also joined by our principal um, search software engineer, Miguel Vieira, who has to, uh, as a specific role in the project at that point in time, and decides to generate um, automatically the data model and uh, look to look at the logical database structure using tool within Django to do so. So obviously in this case, the function of the modeling activity is different, is using uh, the convention um, that he, he, he needs to understand and get himself familiar with that model um, at the level of complexity that is needed for the work that he had to do uh, for the project, which I believe in this case was actually continuization. Um, so uh, all this to say what then, that the production model, as I said, happens across different SDLC phases and across RAC roles. Um, they have, a, if you like, an intersubjective role to share knowledge and make meaning around the project research question within the RSC team and beyond, because more often than not, these models are also used to communicate with partners and to evolve uh, the, the research questions within that specific research domain. Um, and I, I, I hope the examples are useful to show that nonlinear transformation, the models are subject, subjected to across languages of expressions, so from verbal description to graphical representation to standardized conventions and code. Um, and also in a way they create creative potential to bring in multiple perspectives, new knowledge and understanding, which maybe in the 
digital humanities or art humanities and cultural heritage sector, it is maybe more evident that interdisciplinary gap than in other in other areas. Um, next slide, please. Um, Yes, so I think this, this slide I wanted to include simply to give an idea that more often than not, the um, I mentioned originally the objects of study we work with are data, but obviously these data come from somewhere. Um, so in the, in the RSC context where we work, typically um, they are derivatives of some kind from cultural artifacts, historical artifacts of different kinds. Um, and those are already the remnants of what has been produced in the past. So we just have a subset of that. Um, in addition, obviously, there is a subset of the, ar the artifacts we actually are aware of, or we know of. And further down, there is a subset that it's available in the anal analog archives um, or archives that we have. And the digital archive is uh, filtered out, filters out quite a lot of that. And typically the corpora, the corpus that our partners work with is again, usually a a small tip in the ocean. So that, that relationship between the models of analysis that we contribute to develop and the original, if you like, phenomena or objects of study, or squaring the circle between those two is basically the main challenge that our partners face. And our role as RIC is enable that challenging um, uh, undertaking, if you like, in research and make it contribute to the critique of, of those models from an RSC perspective and explaining our processes and being transparent in, in what we aim, we, we, what we produce in the research process. Um, so there are gaps basically that, that are produced in the process and we can uh, contribute to the, to the definition of those biases and gaps by making our processes more transparent. Um, next slide. Yes, I, I don't think there is too much time to talk about um, if you like the, the tail, uh, but very important, the sustainability um, approach that we, we champion in the lab, but you will find on our website, um, there is an archiving sustainability page that outlines um, how we work in terms of uh, assessing holistically uh, the value, if we could, we could call it that way of a project and, and how we, we work towards uh, ensuring that a project has a, a robust uh, forward planning in terms of its life or death, in fact. Um, so we're not scared of talking about some setting for projects and we have a, a layered approach that goes from full maintenance under costed SLAs, which is what um, uh, James also mentioned before, to migration. So increasingly we're also packaging our project to be migrated somewhere else, static conversion, deposit of the data sets which also in the humanities is becoming more and more um, common practice, minimal archiving storage uh, as the last option. Um, and I think that's it. Next slide. I think it's the final yeah, slide for you, James, to, to conclude. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's amazing seeing the detail of your talk, Ariana. I mean, that's the stuff as director that I, I find getting so distant from the actual work. Um, that I, I get a bit down about it sometimes because the, the team does such fantastic work and I think you can see the benefit of the division of labor as well um, the, 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 the disciplines within the lab the research software engineering disciplines are very much team based um, and there's a lot of coordination the thing that, that I'd really like to emphasize and I think it's the really unique thing about KDL is that we view the lab as a socio-technical system. Now, this is a very sort of humanity, social science -y way of looking at things. Um, but if you think about those models and the two sides of this talk, they're actually connected. You know, the, the, um, the detailed modeling work and programming work that um, the team do is sort of seamlessly integrated with the um, human resource and operational and, and planning models within the lab as a whole. So, and as part of that, that philosophy or that assumption that high quality research software engineering outputs um, can only be produced um, if you think holistically about the laboratory context that, that those outputs are being produced in. Um, I mean, as a traditional science laboratory has particular workflows and you need to think about the quality of the materials and, and the fluids and all the rest of it, the, the quality of the methodologies. 
Um, and you also need to make sure that you can attract and retain good staff. Are we really just taking that same approach to, to our lab and, and so viewing it as an experiment, a sort of an experiment of experiments, um, which is why we think at quite a meta level about the modeling. So models for us aren't just about database models and relational models, it's also about models of working and, um, and mo procedural models. And together, the assumption is that that will, that, that will produce um, high quality high quality outputs. Um, so uh, Ariane, if you want to say some final words about the life cycle. Yes, maybe I should have specified indeed, I mentioned in one of the slides that uh, modeling occurs across those different operational um, methods, including uh, monitoring, but indeed then the, the examples I focused on were more specifically about the design and the building um, methods. Um, so there could be more to say about all those other aspects. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that here you have links both to the um, the SDLC uh, templates that uh, we made available. Um, they, they're kind of generalized compared to the ones we use for our projects, but might be useful for others or actually could be criticized. So, so it'd be really good to get some feedback from outside also the digital humanities and cultural heritage um, sectors so from other RICs. Um, you also have a link to a training that we did um, with James and Neil at the lab, Neil Jakeman. Um, and what else? Yes, and then a link to the paper, some of the slides I presented were extracted from. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, I might just say one final word actually, because we haven't talked about the future yet. Um, and it struck me in over the course of this, this talk that yeah, the thinking that we put into KDL um, is now starting to merge into um, a future plan um, for our infrastructure. So the next stage for KDL, the next five years, is going to be about moving away from monolithic web apps, all those monolithic web apps that we inherited, and moving more towards the notion of um, sort of archives as, as data, um, containerization, and enabling next generation um, REC, REC methods. And, you know, we think that the way to do that in an elegant way, in a high quality way, is to continue with that holistic sort of socio-technical way of looking at the lab. And that is going to require us to um, increase um, or, or scale our thinking more towards infrastructure, but also architecture and enterprise architecture. So you see from Ariana's talk that we've got that, we, we understand the, the interaction between say, um, relational data models in our SDLC um, and our careers to some degree. But the next stage is to start thinking in, in terms of enterprise architecture and modeling the way that the lab fits into our institution, into King's and beyond that to um, the, the national UK cyber infrastructure um, European as well, and, and effectively, you know, sort of global after that. So that's that's sort of the, the next five year plan for us. Okay, um, so I'd like to thank James and Ariana very much for a, a really interesting insight into into KDL um, and the work that you've been doing. Um, we, we've got we're going to have a few minutes for. Um, questions now. I just highlight that I know we're we're coming up to uh, the end of the hour, and some of you may need to leave um, uh, on the hour or shortly after. Um, so I would just like to to thank you now. Take the opportunity to thank everybody who's attended uh, this afternoon's talks. And I hope you found it uh, um, a really really interesting uh, couple of talks to see about the sort of work that KDL has been doing uh, in the RSE space. Um, if you have questions, you're welcome to put them into the chat, into the Zoom chat, um, and we can take questions from there. Um, otherwise, if you want to use the raise hand button in the participants window, uh, you're welcome to ask your question in person as well. Um, so do do please feel free to go ahead and, and either put them in the, into the chat or, or ask in person. Um, and I have a question to, to, uh, to kick us off. So uh, just while we're waiting for anybody to add questions into the into the chat, um, so I'm I'm really interested in your your software development life cycle um, and the kind of the structures that you have for that. But I'm also curious how you feel that fits with um, 
the way that research teams work? And do you feel that that is in all cases applicable or do you encounter cases where you know, research teams have a different approach to building software or undertaking their research that may kind of clash with the, the, the very sort of structured life cycle that, that you have? Um, James, you want me to take this, or do you want to? Well, I, I, maybe I can preface it, but you've yeah. got more immediate experience than me. Um, yeah, it was a it was a programmatic decision. It was a conscious decision to put in place a structured life cycle like that because of um, the operational and quality issues that that we we inherited from not having one. So yeah, we try and there are issues there where we. Um, you know, when people first start working with us, we can seem a little bit procrustean, um, but we tend to, the, the issues um, reduce if they start working from us from day one, with us from day one, and if there's genuine intellectual engagement. Um, the, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll hand over to Ariana at that point, but I, I can say that it, it's a, um, it was a conscious decision and, and it, does have implications, but I don't think there's any way that we would we would ever stop doing it. I think it would feel like driving without a seatbelt now if we gave up our SDLC. Yes, I, I agree that our SDLC has become quite um, a treasure for us, um, also to protect us, if you like, sometimes. Uh, but it, but it's true. I should also add that um, is not. Um, one mold. So obviously we have we have a structure and we follow that structure, but projects are very different. So there might be projects where um, that as I kind of into that might have a, a three years, five years um, run and there are projects that might be literally only one sprint or two weeks um, work. So obviously that structure depends and how, how we apply, for example, the templates or our project review process, how we interact with, with partners varies within that spectrum um, but yes the, I, I guess the the core and the important things is the 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 roles and responsibilities within the sub team that works on that project um, and also having some reference documentation no matter how light it might be that help us at least um, uh, in in pacing if you like the rhythm of the project and to have some tracing and trackability of that documentation. So in that sense, we wouldn't let it go, uh, but we are flexible in how we apply that SDLC. Did I answer is, your uh, question? Yeah, and it, it reminds me too that it's something else that we sort of, we do confront in the lab and that, um, you know, the lab is a socio-technical space where research and technology collide and they need to be managed. Um, so we see it as a, it's a it's a point of creative tension and I think if, if you view it in that way if you view it as a genuine collaboration between REC and um, researcher um, and are conscious about about it being a point of creative tension I think it it, it produces very high quality outcomes um, but you've got to be a little bit activist about it in a way I, I think this is is something that um, we're passionate about because we inherited 100 projects that hadn't been um, built with an SDLC and weren't well managed. And we ended up just wasting a lot of time and stress trying to deal with them. It's part of the, you know, this other philosophy in the lab whereby we're saying, well, you know, the days of, of um, stuffing around with wires and boxes um, are, are passing into the past. I mean, there's a there's a space for it. I mean, we need to be able to experiment and have free time, and and that's possible in the lab as well. Although you know we struggle with finding time for it. Um, but our our vision is to have you know a high quality lab that has um, infrastructure and processes, and researchers just turn up and do advanced research. Now, Ten years ago, you want to turn up in a lab and sort of stuff around with servers and. And, and frameworks and experiment. Um, I think now there's a there's a sort of a more mature um, funding and and um, technical research environment that that suggests we, we should just put in those those standard practices and and engage in advanced research. Okay, thanks. That's great. Um, 
the, there's a question in the chat here from Jasper who asks, um, it sounds like the lab is relatively independent and autonomous, which is great. Do you, however, have dependencies with e.g. central IT and how are those managed? Uh, yeah, we do have, um, we're very independent and as part of the um, technologically independent, it's the history of digital humanities at King's where it, did, it evolved for the 1980s with servers under the desks and departments. Um, and they, they grow into an infrastructure um, controlled by us. Um, so that, that's great. Our main um, dependency on IT is um, Active Directory, frankly, um, and um, networking and security. So we could actually, we could decouple completely and shift KDL out of the university, but for Active Directory. Um, and now we want access to the security and networking tools as well. But other than that, um, we're pretty independent. We are talking about shifting into the um, Azure subtenancy, um, but it's on, um, we like to think in an equal basis. It's not as though there aren't inevitable tensions there um, because we, we have heterogeneous technologies and um, we, we don't do things like we have a, a semi um, IT industry standard mode of doing things, but we, we insist on, on having our independence and, and flexibility as well. So it's a, um, it's a bit of a, a moving feast. We also have relationships with e-research, of course, too. So at King's, um, we have an overarching e-research e strategy. And the idea is that IT will look after the wires and boxes and infrastructure, um, and we'll develop an e-research function that's more academic facing. And KDL are, are sort of positioned as a, one of our lead um, research software engineering labs, and we're trying to sort of export the models from KDL and other teams um, to inform that, that larger e-research project. So it's, it's quite a um, complex domain, but yeah, we're, we're fairly independent. Um, and as far as management of them um, goes, it's, it's generally collegial, but I do um, sit on um, some IT committees as well. So we have a voice there. One of the major things, I mean, this will be, won't be news to anybody because it's, 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 it's common across all universities, is, is just developing that procedural alignment um, and working relationship between the local REC teams and central IT. And, and that's, again, where our SDLC and approach to HR and, and what have you is, and, and the way that we look at the lab is making things a little bit easier because it's not as though IT see us as completely feral research software engineers off doing their own thing and refusing to engage with, with standard methodology. We're sort of meeting them in a halfway house and we've got a common language. Um, and, yeah, so that, that's part of another reason why we want to... Um, start thinking more about architecture so that we can define those relationships with IT more clearly. And maybe one thing to add, even if it's not necessarily related to technical dependencies, if you like, is that obviously we do reporting to faculty and we yeah. have our annual report and financial reporting and so on. So yes, we are to a certain extent run autonomously, but not, not entirely. We do have those lines. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're fully under line management within arts and humanities, um, but it's the IT or service provider to arts and humanities. Our management lines are into arts and humanities. Um, and we do we sort of engage in radical transparency in a way. So we have a, a, an annual report that's about to come out in a couple of weeks, and it's sort of 50 pages long. Uh, and it's just fully transparent about the cost of the lab, the departments we work with, all sorts of metrics. Um, so if, if there's a tactic in terms of our, the, the way we operate within our institution, if, if there's a single tactic, it's just based on radical transparency and positioning the lab as an experiment. So um, my conversations with my managers is basically along the lines of, well, well look, the lab's an experiment, so there's a bit of risk there, but we're going to be fully transparent about how we run it and have conversations with you about how it should be best calibrated. Um, and that level of openness has actually has sort of brought management on and gotten them invested in the lab, which, which has helped a lot. That's very interesting. Thank you. There was a question on other, did you see that, James? Do research group at King's tend also to have their own embedded RICs or does any 
everyone use your services? I think maybe from your research perspective, your best place to answer that. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, yeah, there are lots of teams like us across Kings. We're one of the most prominent, um, but I think just because of the way that we conceptualize and sort of present ourselves. Um, but there are, there are teams in health sciences. Um, there are the individual scientific programmers dotted around the place as well. So quite a big community of RSEs at Kings. Um, and um, no, so no, not everyone uses our services. We initially, when we went live five years ago, we were going to be King's Digital Lab and, and potentially look at working with everyone across the campus, but we had to stop that within about a month. Um, and now we, we've really only got the capacity to work with arts and humanities, although we're, we're talking about broadening out to social science as well. So the model for e-research at King's is to have a distributed e-research infrastructure across the institution as a whole with um, REC teams like KDL close embedded within faculty as close to the research communities as possible, which I think is the right way to go for us anyway. But I like the fact that, that they're saying, or we're saying that RECs um, need to be close to the domain experts. Um, e-research is a central sort of function um, is there for policy and enabling and, and buying infrastructure and HPC and keeping all that sort of stuff running. Um, but REC teams like KDL should be nestled as close to the research communities as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we will, at this point, we will uh, wrap up this part of the, the session. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to say again, thank you very much, James and Ariana, for your for your talks. Um, and thank you to everyone who, who attended uh, today's session. Um, just to to um, to highlight a couple of things, we've got the, the next source event that's coming up on the 7th of October. Um, so there's two talks there. Um, you can you can find details on the source website. Um, there's a link there and you can also find the, the link to, um, to to register for that event. And uh, also, can I highlight our source news mailing list, um, which you can join if you want to get reminders of upcoming events and, and uh, registration details. Um, so uh, thank you again, um, everyone, and uh, we will we will close this part of the of the session uh, here. Thanks, Jeremy.